Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mad Scientist Financial Independence Podcast, the podcast where I get inside the minds of some of the best and brightest in the personal finance world to find out how they achieved early financial independence. I'm extremely excited to introduce my guest today. Uh, not only is he a writer for some big-time publications such as Entrepreneur Magazine and Time.com, uh, he is actually the creator of the first blog I ever read, a blog that Money Magazine named the web's most inspiring personal finance blog. Now, I can't remember exactly what year it was I stumbled upon GetRichSlowly.org, but it was definitely the first blog I ever subscribed to, and up until that point, I really didn't get what blogs were all about, really. Um, I know that may be surprising since I'm a professional software developer, but I actually got into computer science through math, and I, it was because I was good at math, and I liked math, and uh, so I was never really a, like an internet geek. I didn't spend 20 hours a day on the computer or anything like that, so I, I didn't get blogs, and it wasn't until I stumbled upon Get Rich Slowly that I was like, oh, this is this is pretty cool. This is just some you know guy that is not a professional, but he's writing amazing content about money and personal finance, and uh, yeah, I just fell in love with it, and I just consumed the content religiously, and, uh, and that's why I'm so excited that I'm going to get to speak to the creator of Get Rich Slowly, uh, J.D. Roth, today. So, um, JD is now writing most of his content over at jdroth.com, uh, which is his personal site. Um, it's titled More Than Money. So he, uh, he did, he does still talk quite a bit about money and personal finance, but, uh, he throws a bunch of other good stuff in there as well. Um, for example, he, he just started a series this year that, uh, he's talking about personal and financial freedom, uh, every Monday, uh, during the year. And, those articles have just been incredible. So, he's also got some really exciting projects uh, in the works that I'm excited to talk to him about. And uh, yeah, it's just going to be really cool to tap into some of his experience. He's been writing about money for you know almost the past decade, and uh, some of the best stuff on the web uh, for personal finance is uh, is because of him. So, without further delay, uh, hey JD, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Hey Brandon, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, as I said in the intro, uh, Get Rich Slowly was the first blog I ever read in my life. Um, I, I really didn't even know what a blog was before I stumbled across <laughs> Get Rich Slowly. And I was like, oh, man, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. I want to get rich slowly. And then I, I was like, oh, just some guy named JD's reading that, writing this. And it's just, I guess that's what a blog is. So, uh, so yeah, you've, uh, yeah, very appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thanks so much. I have to say, though, it was it was probably the most difficult interview I've had to prepare for, though, and, and there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, your your body of work is so big. You you founded Get Rich Slowly back in uh, 2006, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and I think at one point you were writing like 12 articles per week, and mm -hmm. and you've just been prolific ever since. And uh, so it was very hard to like pinpoint actual specific topics to talk about. And then um, <laughs> the second reason is. Uh, you know, the way you're writing is, it, it feels like I already know you. So it feels like, you know, now I'm sure you get that from a lot of your readers. Like, I do actually. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a testament to your writing. Um, but yeah, I feel like I know you. So it's like, it was like trying to plan what I'm going to talk about to a friend when I'm going out to lunch. You just don't really, <laughs> you don't really do that too often. So, so I, I've well, decided we, we to just chat about whatever. Yeah. Well, that's the plan. That's what I figured. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to, just treat it like, yeah, we're sitting down to lunch, having a, a beer or something, and we can just chat about money and see, you know, what you've learned over the, you know, past eight years of really thinking about and writing about money so much. So, I hope that sounds good to you. Yeah, it sounds great. Excellent. So, uh, so yeah, if if, if you wouldn't uh, mind just giving a little bit of background about yourself for people that may not know you from GetRichSlowly.org or your your uh, new site JDRoth.com. Sure. Well, uh, I was uh, born and raised uh, out here near Portland, Oregon. That's where I live now and uh, grew up in a relatively poor family. Uh, my father was a serial entrepreneur. He was always starting businesses. Uh, some of those succeeded. Some of them didn't. Uh, but when he did have money, when he did have a successful business, he, he didn't save any money. He just spent it. He squandered it. And I recognized early on that if I wanted to go to school, I was going to have to fund my own way through college. So uh, the way I decided to do that was to, I was a smart enough kid, so I thought, oh, well, I'll try to do scholarships. And I, I was fortunate that I, I managed to get full ride to, uh, scholarships to college. And, uh, so I could have, in theory, graduated from college with no debt. 
and I did graduate without any student loans, but I graduated with the start of a credit card habit because while I was in college, I started trying to keep up with the Joneses or the roommates anyhow. And uh, to do that, because I didn't have any money, I, I, I had to start signing up for credit cards. And back in the late 80s, they were pro- – uh, you don't sell credit cards. What do you do? G- getting students to sign up on campus. And yeah, free, uh, I, I was free sucker- frisbees and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And I, I was a sucker and fell for it. So developed this uh, debt problem that built during the 1990s until uh, in 2004, uh, my ex-wife and I, now ex-wife, but at the time she was, we were married, uh, we were buying a new home. And uh, on paper, I could afford it, but it ended up kind of just – it was like the straw that broke the camel's back, I guess. It was just too much debt and everything involved with it made it so that I just felt overwhelmed. And uh, I think I had – it was just over $35,000 in consumer debt at the time and it was just getting worse and worse. And so some friends finally thought I was ready to listen to reason and they loaned me some books. I read the books and implemented what I learned, started writing about what I learned and uh, from there got out of debt, built wealth and – started getrichslowly.org where I shared my uh, successes and failures along the way. And uh, and that, that all came from uh, just a single post on your personal blog, right? Is that you just wrote a post called Get Rich Slowly about, you know, what you're, you know, what you're starting to read and things yeah. like that. Is that right? Yeah, th- th- that's right. So uh, uh, there are a lot of things. It, nobody sets out to say, oh, I'm going to be a blogger or maybe they do nowadays, but in 2006, you didn't do that. Uh, so there are a lot of things that led up to me founding Get Rich Slowly. And uh, part of that was I'd been programming computers and working with computers since I was in fourth grade. Uh, I was a writer. I always wanted to be a writer. I thought I would write science fiction or poetry, but uh, I ended up writing about personal finance. Um, And so I had been blogging since before blog was even a word. I kept what we called online journals or web journals. And I wrote. I, I like to say that I wrote about cats, computers, and comic books because those were the those were the things I liked. Uh, but I was writing about what I was learning about personal finance too. And I, I wrote this article called "Get Rich Slowly" that was really just an attempt to summarize everything that I had been reading because I, I thought there were the I had read maybe a dozen personal finance books by this point, and they all seemed to have this theme that you can't get rich quickly, but you can get rich slowly, and. Uh, So that article was just a way for me to summarize what I had learned, and it it ended up being very successful. For whatever reason, a lot of people liked that article, and it prompted me to start a blog based on that. Right. So so that's, uh, I believe, April 2006. Is that when you actually founded GetRichSlowly.org? Yeah, I say it's April 15th, 2006, but I had a few posts that were up a little bit before that, but April 15th, 2006. So what is that? That's uh, almost exactly eight years ago. Wow, yeah. So you start writing a lot there about personal finance, and a lot of it was your personal journey. Um, Absolutely. And it, and it quickly took off, and you started making money off the site. Is that right? Yeah, and actually, just the other day, I found my old spreadsheets. I, I'm one of these people who just tracks things obsessively. Like when I'm trying to lose weight, I track that obsessively. I track my spending obsessively, and so naturally, I tracked my uh, uh, blog income. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, the Get Rich Slowly itself – the blog, it, it grew relatively relatively quickly. Uh, it, there were a few reasons for it, I think. Uh, one was I wrote fairly often. Second was it, this was a time when a lot of people were anonymous. They were writing about personal fin- finance on the web anonymously if they were doing blogs. And I wasn't anonymous in any ways. I was very public about who I was and what I was doing and how I was failing and what I was doing right. And uh, my philosophy, Brandon, is that I feel like a lot of people when they write online, whether it's about personal finance or other things, they're afraid to be completely open and honest because uh, I don't know. There's this impression that people are going to get stalkers following them or whatever. And but I found that by telling my story and being completely open and honest, it it helped build connections with readers. And so when I speak at blogging conferences and stuff, I, I stress the importance of telling story. I feel like it's a great way for people to connect. Yeah, absolutely, and that's definitely something I'm, I'm striving to get better at. And uh, and yeah, and that and that's exactly why you know it felt like I would be talking to an old friend today because yeah, I just feel <laughs> like I connect with you on such a personal level. And uh, so so by 2007, you know, I 
based on stuff you had written on your blog, you, you know, you're making a pretty good income. So I'm, I'm assuming yeah. by then you had made a pretty big dent in your consumer debt or. Yeah. Well, so I started tackling the consumer debt in October of 2004. I, I've actually uncovered the, uh, like it's not a WordPress a processing document, but it's basically a, a plan that I wrote out. Uh, and I wrote it in October of 2004, and I said, by December 2007, I want to be debt-free. And I had this plan. And things didn't go exactly to plan, but I actually did end up in December of 2007 paying off the last of my debt, and uh, of my consumer debt. And so that, that went according to schedule, anyhow, that part. And uh, the blog growth, the income from the blog – it grew very slowly at first. I was showing my girlfriend the uh, the numbers the other day, and I think the first month, uh, March of 2006, was something like $40, and then the next month was $80 and so on. But by like July of 2007, I was making $1,000 a month or maybe it was two or three. No, it had to have been more than that. I had to have been getting really close to uh, my income that I was making for my day job, which was about $4,000 a month. Uh, and So that's within – a month or 15 or a year or 15 months, I was making as much from the blog as I was making from my day job, wow. which made it so I could quit. And then when, when did, did you actually quit? Uh, I quit in March of 2008. Okay. So, uh, started, started trying to get out of debt, October, 2004, started to get rich slowly in, uh, April of 2006, paid off the last of my debt, December of 2007, quit my day job, uh, March of 2008. Okay. So how, how was your, how, how was your attitude towards money changing? How, as someone who was previously in debt, did the mm-hmm. increase in income, did that change how, how you're spending? Did you increase your spending to match a lot of that income or did by then no. did you have oh. a pretty good handle over it? At that point. So a large part of the problem that I had when I was younger is, uh, my parents who hadn't had a lot of money had never taught me how to have a healthy relationship with money, I guess. I talk about money blueprints sometimes, and th- these are the uh, blueprints we get from our family and our friends, but especially from our parents, uh, about how we interact with money and how we think about money. And I also talk about how uh, smart money management isn't, has nothing to do with math. It's all about the mental side of things. And my problem wasn't the, uh, the math, because again, the math is easy, and I had been like one of the top students in the nation at business math. I competed in a business math event for future business leaders of America, and I competed at a national level. And I understood the math, but that didn't stop me from making dumb decisions because I, I didn't have a master of the emotional side. But in the process of paying off my debt, uh, I started reducing my expenses, and my income increased at the same time, obviously. And I was getting a better control on the emotional side of money. But the thing of it is, uh, even though I got a better control, better control of it then and, and have continued to build control, I still don't have a complete mastery of it to this day. Uh, here we are in 2014, and I still have issues with uh, personal finance. And I, I think everybody does, but it, it's just interesting to me that even knowing everything that I know, and having read so much about it and written so much about it, there are still times that I find myself buying things just because I want them. And, and th- that's kind of illogical, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm the same. I still struggle with things like um, I'll have this chunk of money that I'm ready to invest. And then I'm like, well, I'll just wait until the market goes down a bit first. And it's like, well, that, <laughs> that never works out. Over the long run, it doesn't work out. And I know it, but it's still, it's just like... Yeah, so that's why automation and things like that are are good things for a person like me. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's amazing. You can talk about it and write about it so much, but it, it's still your brain that's sabotaging things at the end of the day. And, and I think you've hit on, on a very important thing. So one of the things that I just – a project that I'm currently working on, I think we're going to talk about this, is I, I just wrote a, a guide to how to be the CFO of your own life, be your own CFO. And uh, the whole premise of that is if – more people were to manage their personal finances as if they were managing a business's finances, uh, they would be more successful with their money. And part of that is learning to automate good behavior. It's kind of a way to uh, take your brain out of the equation, or not your brain, but your emotions and uh, uh, your bad habits. If you can automate the right things like investing 
or a, a paying off debt, whatever it is. Find ways to automate the good behavior so that you're not thwarting yourself. I think that's very important. Absolutely. And yeah, we'll definitely, uh, we'll be talking more about that, uh, as the show continues. Um, so yeah, to get back. So, so you're, you know, you pay off your debt, uh, at the end of 2007, mm-hmm. uh, get rich slowly is really taken off. Um, and then, uh, by March 2009, you had sold the site, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously received a quite a sizable windfall from that. Right. Um, and, but you couldn't tell anybody, which uh, you, what, you had to wait like three years or something to tell. Yeah, it sucked. Well, um, th- there was no defined time in the contract. I was just under obligation. I could not discuss. Uh, there was a non-disclosure built into the contract, and I still can't talk much about it. Uh, but I can say that uh, throughout 2008, I had received a lot of interest. Uh, a number of people had emailed me and asked whether Get Rich Slowly was for sale. And I, I thought that was just kind of ludicrous. I thought it was a joke. I, why would anybody buy a blog? Um, but then towards the end of 2008, I decided, oh, you know, maybe I should uh, actually pay more attention to this. It, it's wrong to just dismiss it out of hand. I should at least see what people have to say. And th- there were some other things going on in the background. Uh, I was beginning to realize that I wasn't quite happy with where I was in life, uh, with who I was, with my marriage, and some other things. And then in January 2009, uh, my best friend committed suicide. And, and this had a profound impact on me. And it made me realize that I was, uh, I don't know, I, I was foregoing today uh, chasing some unknown tomorrow. And I realized I needed a little bit more balance. And uh, I had been working like mad at Get Rich Slowly, just hours and hours and hours, tons of time, um, like 80 plus hours a week. And it, was, it wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for the marriage. It wasn't good for anything. So all of this led me to say, okay, I'm going to entertain offers. So the first offer came in at the beginning of 2009 to buy Get Rich Slowly. And uh, I asked the guy, okay, how much are you willing to offer? And he said, $5,000. And I laughed him off because at that time I was actually every once in a while I would have a five thousand dollar day, believe it or not. It was just I was having amazing income there. Um, but the second offer, I said, "All right, what do you offer?" And they said, "Well, we don't know. We have to see your financials." And I that took me aback because I was like, "Whoa, do I really want to share what's going on behind the scenes?" Right. And so I talked to my lawyer, and my accountant, and they said, "No, no, no. This is standard procedure. Show them the, the stuff." And so. They spent a couple of weeks looking at the uh, figures, and meanwhile, I talked with my wife, and we talked, uh, what would it take for us to sell? And so we came up with a number. Okay, we would sell the blog if we were offered this much money. And uh, uh, the offer came back about 50% higher than that. So we're like, whoa. Because <laughs> nice. we, we thought we had set some sort of unreasonable, crazy target, and here they came back with 50% more than that. And uh, I kind of felt like I was out of my league, so uh, – I, I found some investment bankers and they helped shop around to a, a second potential buyer and the second potential buyer offered even more money. And so anyway, yes, the ultimate result was uh, I did sell the blog and receive a large windfall. And uh, it, was, uh, it was completely unexpected. I had never set out to do that. And I feel very grateful for it to this day. It's an, it's an amazing thing. Absolutely. So, so how did, so did that, was that challenging when you, when you received the windfall? Was it, you know, was it hard to make the right decisions? Uh, or did you allocate a little bit to yourself to, you know, like f- feel that urge to maybe spend some more since you had, uh, since you had received some money? Well, well, I, I allocated some. I mean, uh, I bought some new furniture and we took a trip. And that, that was what we had uh, decided to do. Uh, but the rest of the money, no, because it was just this completely unexpected thing, it, it wasn't hard to set it aside and to follow my own advice and put it in index funds. And actually, a lot of it went into m- municipal bonds at the time because my wife was really, really nervous about the stock market. This, again, March of 2009, that was right at the bottom of the market. And even though I wanted to pour it all into index funds, I actually wanted to put it all into uh, – and GE, I think it was. I can't actually remember what stock I was so hung up on at the time. There was one stock that was down below 10 and I just wanted to buy, buy, buy. <laughs> but uh, put it into index funds and mutual funds or index funds and uh, municipal bonds. And uh, okay, let's see, you had asked something. Oh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, the NDA and not being able to talk about it. And that was really, really hard for me because. After being so open for so many years yes, on the blog. Absolutely. It, I had built 
I mean, the whole foundation of my blog was talking about what I was experiencing and uh, where I was coming from. And to not be able to talk about this was just killed me. And so I had asked from time to time, can I write about it yet? Can I write about it yet? Can I write about it yet? And eventually, about three years later, they said, yeah, go ahead. You can write about it. And so uh, I got to tell the story finally. Yeah, I remember. I remember that day. I uh, yep, got that. Uh, got the email in the old RSS reader. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll get rich slowly, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, that, so it definitely sounds like it was good that you're, you, know, you had that mental shift well before the, the windfall oh, came yeah. and everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because you know you read so much about how lottery winners and and professional athletes they get these huge windfalls and they spend money like crazy. So it it doesn't matter that they've had this huge influx of money because they're uh, spending it just to match the new income, and it just screws them up. Mm-hmm. Now on this, on the other hand, uh, I also there are a couple of competing things going on. First of all, I don't believe there's any virtue in dying uh, with a huge fortune. I don't have children, so I'm one of those people who wants to die broke, Mm -hmm. and I want to die with having spent my last dollar. But obviously, we don't know when we're going to die, so it's hard to figure that out when that's going to be. And uh, in my family, we have a history of uh, health problems. Uh, Many of the men die young of cancer, and so there's a part of me that's like, oh, yeah, I should spend it while I can. Mm -hmm. And so the balance I've taken is, uh, no, I'm going to live a decent, comfortable life, uh, not extra- extravagant, but I'm not going to deprive myself either. And uh, I'm going to live within my means. And if I do find out I have a terminal illness, well, then I'm pulling out all the stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, um, this uh, leads nicely into the next thing I was hoping to talk to you about. Um, you've uh, started a new series on your personal site, jdroth.com, mm-hmm. um, about personal and financial freedom and you know, a lot of, a lot of that is in pursuing happiness and overcoming fear and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, a lot of it is based on, you know, how you, how, how you feel about money, how you, you know, obtain happiness from, you know, simpler things and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I would just hoping just to get your, uh, brief rundown of what you have planned for this whole year long, uh, personal and financial freedom, uh, series on the blog. Sure, you bet. So uh, after I sold Get Rich Slowly uh, in 2009, I hung around and uh, I basically acted as editor and main writer for another three years because I just couldn't tear myself away. I wasn't contractually obligated to do that. In fact, I had negotiated the ability to just walk away at any time. I had given up a lot of money so that I could do that uh, because the company that bought it wanted me to stick around for three years and they would have paid me to do it and then I didn't do it. (laughs) Um, Anyway, uh, so... JDRoth.com now is, uh, I call the uh, blog that I'm running there, I call it More Than Money because I, while I do write a little bit about personal finance, I actually write about other topics in addition to that. And you're right, what I've been focusing on for 2014 is personal and financial freedom. And this is an outgrowth of a presentation that I made in Ecuador uh, last September. Uh, Mr. Money Mustache and uh, JL Collins and H and I uh, and Cheryl uh, Reed the four of us got together and we held a retreat or a Chautauqua as we call it uh, in Ecuador and uh, we had about 25 people, I think it was 23 maybe, uh, who came down to talk about financial freedom and happiness and all, all the different things in, involved with that. And uh, I didn't prepare my presentation in advance. I'd been reading a lot of different things on the subject, on freedom and uh, uh, happiness just for my own edification. And we got down there and I listened to uh, Cheryl make her presentation, and I listened to Jim Collins make his, and then I listened to uh, Mr. Money Mustache make his. And after all of that, I sat down and I said, "All right, based on what they've said and based on what I've been reading, here's what I want to talk about." And so I just uh, one afternoon drafted this presentation, and uh, I made it the next day, and it went over very well. People were, um, I guess, intrigued by it. And so I, I sat down and I said, "All right, I'm going to write a, a book based on this." Or an ebook based on this, and uh, ended up the ebook kind of fizzled out. But I had all this material that I had produced and I, about a topic that I feel passionately about. And so what I've been doing is sharing that at uh, jdroth.com uh, during 2014. So just now, uh, we, we just neared the end of the uh, section on fear about overcoming fear. How do you handle fear in your life? And we're going to start the section on what happiness is and how you move from being afraid 
and living a life where you make decisions based on fear and instead make decisions based on happiness and your own well-being. Excellent. Yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a great series so far and I'm really looking forward to uh, that section in particular, per- particular because uh, I'm actually awesome. in the process of uh, writing a, a master's thesis and it's a lot on um, uh, happiness and consumption and how they relate and some of the decision making and things like that that go on. And, um, and, and so do you find that there is a relationship between consumption or and happiness, whether it's a negative one or a positive correlation? Um, there, it, it's positive up to a point. Um, all the mm-hmm. data suggests that, you know, once you hit a certain income level, um, then it really, it doesn't, there's diminishing returns. It, it, it really doesn't make you happier. And, and a lot of it's because happiness, um, you know, it, it relates to how, your spending relates to other people around you. So it's right. more, it's not an absolute level of consumption that makes you happy. It's like, it's a relative level of consumption. And, you know, yes. you know, as you start increasing your consumption, then you start hanging out with people that are consuming even more. And it just, it never, you know, like the hedonic treadmill and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been really interesting. So I'm, I'm excited to, to read your series on it as well. It'll be yeah. perfect timing actually. Um, and, and you know what? I, I'm not sure that I have anything in there. I'm trying to remember uh, about the relationship between consumption and happiness. I, I'm sure I must have something, but I know that uh, when I wrote this, uh, I was thinking a lot about me high accept me uh concept of flow mm. and uh, experiencing happiness or fulfillment uh, through the things you do and the choices you make and, and uh, your daily activities, I guess. And so, it goes very much to the idea that uh, you see all over the place that uh, it's actually experiences that have a greater impact on our happiness rather than the things we have. It's the things we do. Absolutely. Yep. That's uh, yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, the, just based on a lot of the data I've been looking at, like um, happiness in America hasn't increased at all since the 1950s, um, mm-hmm. but productivity has increased by four times. So it's, we could, theoretically, you know, work a quarter of what they worked back in the fifties and, you know, be able to have all the, the goods and services that they enjoyed and have, you know, just as happy of a, of a lifestyle as, as they did back then. And, uh, there's, there's there was a lot of talk about, you know, um, extrinsic things like uh, buying things so that, you know, for status and that, that doesn't make you happy. It's the intrinsic mm-hmm. things that really matter and like building relationships. But it's the problem with, humans is that we were really bad at predicting what will make us happy. So exactly right. That's a Daniel Gilbert stuff. Yeah, exactly. When we're presented with like a, uh, an increase in salary. Yeah. We think, Oh, that'll make me happy, but it's, it doesn't make us happy enough to deal with the longer hours and the, the, the higher stress and the more time away from family and things like that. So, right. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's definitely, not connected and, and especially in America where everyone's standard of living is, you know, already incredibly wealthy compared to the rest of the world. It's, we've already hit, we've already exceeded that minimum level where, you know, money will make us happy. And now it's just all not going to improve us anymore. So, right. That's exactly right. And, uh, yeah, in, you've already mentioned this during your series and this is a book that actually our mutual friend, Jim Collins from jlcollinsnh.com uh, had recommended to me, and it's uh, Harry Brown's uh, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. And this is a book that I hadn't read until about two years ago or a year and a half ago when Jim recommended it to me, and it, it just it blew me away. So I'd, li- I'd just like to get your take on it because I know it's an important book to you as well. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think it, 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 it was a book that was very revolutionary uh, when, to me when I read it. It's a book, first of all, that was written in the early 1970s by a uh, man named Harry Brown. And he's uh, best known for being the libertarian candidate for president in, I think, 96 and 2000. And, uh, well, I consider myself a small L libertarian in that I, I subscribe to some libertarian ideas. I by no means subscribe to the, uh, the party type stuff. The Libertarian Party type stuff. But um, uh, the book itself, while it eventually gets to libertarian politics, most of it is about just personal freedom and how you achieve personal freedom. And reading what Harry Brown wrote about it was just kind of revolutionary to me because I was raised – I don't know. I I wanted to please people all the time and I always felt like I had to have their permission to do things, you know. Um, And I think a lot of us feel like that. We're raised – 
we're, we're raised in families where we need our parents' permission to do things, right? To, to go hang out with friends or, or to do anything. And then we go to school and, and we need permission to do things. And then we go to work and we need permission from our bosses to do things. And what we don't realize when we get out on our own is for the most part, we don't actually need permission. We don't need permission to uh, choose to live differently, I guess. If you want to pursue early retirement, even though nobody else is interested in it, you don't need anybody's permission to do that. That's your choice and you can do it. And uh, so Harry Brown's writing about how you can choose to do whatever you want to, essentially, uh, as long as you're not infringing on the rights of others. Uh, you can do what you want. And it, it, it was... It seems pretty obvious. Uh, well, actually, some people really disagree with that. But uh, for those of us who ha- follow this path of trying to pursue f- personal freedom, it becomes this thing that seems pretty obvious. But it's it's not obvious when you're just starting out, you know. And it, even for me, at age forty, it wasn't obvious. I, it didn't feel obvious that I was free to do whatever I wanted. I, I completely agree. And yeah, like um, I think actually through Get Rich Slowly, I. I I probably about five years ago, four or five years ago, I'd stumbled upon early early retirement extreme dot com, and that just completely changed, you know, my whole plan financially. Before, you know, I'd I was never a big spender. I would just, you know, I'd save a lot and then take a bit of time off and then work some more and take a bit of time off. And uh, but then when I realized, hey, I could actually just work really hard for you know five years and then take off mm-hmm. for good. That was just that changed my mind. That just changed my life completely. And then. How I met, how I found freedom in an unfree world, sort of did the same thing for my non-financial life. If you know what I mean, it, it just completely opened my eyes. Like, yeah, like I'm following all these rules, but most of these rules are dumb. If <laughs> they they may not apply to me, and there's no sense just to, just following things blindly. And it right. just made me question everything, and it and it's been great. It, it I just yeah, it's a it's the book I recommend more than any other book. Like I think. Many people come to me to ask, you know, what what finance book would you recommend? And I, I always steer them towards that, just because it's, mm-hmm. it's more important, I think, than you know, because the math's easy, as you said before. And, and I I agree with you a hundred percent. It is more important, and it sounds funny to people when they come to me and they want recommendations for personal finance books, and I recommend that, or I also recommend a, a book called Mastery by George Leonard. Oh, I haven't read that, one. which is about um, how you achieve mastery in any subject. He's writing specifically about. Uh, Martial arts, I think, is the examples that he uses most of the time. And he talks about how it, it's not a linear thing. It's just this gradual process of getting a little bit better and then getting a little worse and then getting a little better and getting a little worse. And uh, it actually is a great personal finance book because it, it helps you realize, oh, I'm not going to be perfect and I'm going to make mistakes along the way. But uh, So recommending these non-finance books as good personal finance books, I think, kind of startles some people. And and another thing I wanted to say, Brandon, is when you read a book like um, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World or uh, Your Money or Your Life uh, or uh, Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover, there are always going to be parts that you disagree with. And one thing that really frustrates me when people read these books and they decide they don't agree with certain aspects that the author is writing about is they will just discard everything from the book so they might read total money makeover and decide oh dave ramsey is christian and i'm not christian so i can't agree with what he's writing about getting out of debt and i think that's just bogus Mm -hmm. you you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. you've got to be able to read a book intelligently and, and go through and say oh these are some interesting ideas and i don't agree with everything the author is writing about but these things are particularly applicable to me and i can put them to use in my life and so uh, I find that it's very uh, – it makes it so that I'm able to read all sorts of different kinds of books and get great nuggets out of them even if I disagree with even a majority of the material. Absolutely. I completely agree. And uh, just to go back, Mastery by George who? I'm sorry? Uh, I think it's George Leonard. Hold on a sec. I'm going to lean back. <laughs> I know I have it on my shelf someplace. Yeah, George Leonard. It's Mastery, the Keys to Success and Long-Term Fulfillment. Excellent. Yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for everybody, and that's definitely something I'll be checking out as well. Because yeah, I haven't I haven't read that one, so that's cool. Well, yeah, so you know, you've like I said, you've been you've been at this for t- since two thousand six, and um, you know, you one of the go to guys for anything finance related in the on the internet. So what what are the most important things you've learned along that journey? What do you like if you had to just narrow it down to? So what's most important uh, over that journey, what would you say? 
Uh, well, th- there are a few things. Uh, first of all, it- it's very important to take agency. And by that, I mean, take responsibility for your situation, for your uh, future, for your destination, where you're going. It, don't wait for somebody else to solve your problems for you. What I like to say is it may not be – your situation may not be your fault, but it's your responsibility to get out of it and to change it if you don't like where you're in. So uh, I find that a lot of my friends and even myself in, in the past uh, make excuses for where they are and what they're doing. And they say, well, it, it's not my fault that I'm here and so – but I'm stuck, blah, blah, blah. It, and – I've just reached a point where I realize, no, all the, the past doesn't matter. What matters is the future. It doesn't matter how you got here or why you're here. What matters is what you're going to do with the hand that you've been dealt. And so I think that's a very important thing uh, for people to understand. And I think one of the uh, biggest changes in my way of thinking and most important changes actually occurred in the past year in this um, retreat that we talked about uh, going to uh, Ecuador uh, when I got to spend a lot of time with – J.L. Collins N.H. and and Mr. Money Mustache, and uh, to talk to people who had achieved uh, financial independence and and to hear uh, what Mr. Money Mustache's philosophy is actually uh, about and all that. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is we hear a lot of times from financial advisors that you should save 10% of your income or 20% of your income. And that's great. That's fantastic. I'm not going to argue that you're doing a bad thing by saving that much. But when you save only 10% or only 20%, you're basically locking yourself into a lifetime of work. It's going to take you 40 or 45 years to accumulate enough money to be able to retire. However, if you increase the amount that you're saving so that you're saving 50% of your income or 70% of your income, amazing things happen. All of a sudden, you can retire in 15 years or 20 years or 10 years. Uh, The more you save, the quicker retirement can come. And when you actually look at this, and I think uh, Mr. Money Mustache calls it the shockingly simple math of early retirement, mm-hmm. it, it's a, it, it is. It, it's, it's an amazing thing, and it's revolutionary when you actually sit down and look at the numbers and think about it. And if people would understand that if they took just a decade to live meagerly, it, it's not a life sentence. Um, it, what it does is, is it sets them, so, sets them up uh, to be able to do a lot of different things while they're still young, while they're 35 or 40 years old, that they're, they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Because when you're locked into a career for 40 or 45 years, you basically limit the choice that you have. But when you're able to achieve some sort of financial freedom, financial independence, all of a sudden, the world is your oyster. The whole thing opens up and you can do whatever you want. In that, a lot of what you're going to want to do will be stuff that produces income. Uh, but you can't get to that point unless you're making the smart choices early on, I guess. Absolutely. And, and as I've found personally, as you, you know, you, you mentioned a somewhat meager existence during those 10 years, but as I've, as I've cut back as mo- as much as possible to, you know, increase my savings rate to 70 plus, um, I, I find that I'm happier and it's yeah. not, it's not actually not a sacrifice. It may feel like it at first, uh, but after a while, you're just like, oh, I don't, I don't miss that. It, it added nothing to my life anyway, and I'm happier because I'm focusing on other things that actually do. Yeah, well, and see, that's the secret. I mean, you got to get people to buy into it by making them realize that it's not going to be a life sentence. But then once they actually start practicing the stuff, I think they realize, oh, well, this isn't so bad after all. So even if it were a life sentence, it wouldn't be so bad. Absolutely. So you mentioned the Chautauqua, the Chautauqua um, and you're actually doing another one of those this fall. Is that correct? Oh, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this fall, we're actually doing two. There, there's going to be two halves. Uh, uh, Mr. Money Mustache and J.L. Collins NH are uh, doing one along with uh, Jesse Meekum from You Need a Budget. And then uh, I will be joining David Kane from Raptitude.com uh, for the second week. And uh, uh, Cheryl Reed will be at both weeks. She's, she's the actual hostess down there. So. And uh, are there still spots opened? Uh, the first session with uh, Mr. Money Mustache and J.L. Collins NH, that, that is sold out. And as of this recording, uh, there are still spots available for uh, the second week with me and David Keane from Aptitude. Okay, great. Um, and you also, let's get back to this uh, Be Your Own CFO for uh, 
the the guide that you're producing. So would you uh, would you talk a bit more about that, please? Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm friends with a fellow named Chris Gillibo who writes a blog called The Art of Nonconformity, and he produces a conference here in Portland called uh, World Domination Summit, and he's also producing one called Pioneer Nation, and uh, uh, he also produces a series of eBooks. Oh, I'm not supposed to call it an ebook. He produces a series of guides uh, uh, that he calls the unconventional guides. So it's the unconventional guide to travel, the unconventional guide to um, may, uh, earning money with your art, things like that. And so he asked me if I would write an un- unconventional guide to money. And so uh, I spent a long time thinking about what exactly, uh, well, what kind of approach would I take? to writing about money and, and what is an unconventional way people can look at money to um, better manage it in their lives. And what I came up with is one of the things that helped me turn my life around was to begin managing my personal finances as if I were managing a business's finances. And so uh, I hit upon this idea. It's not original to me. There are other people who've written about it before about uh, being the CFO of your own life. And so I spent several months writing this guide, almost all of it is from scratch, about how to be your own CFO. And so it's a 100-page guide, and it's full of lots of great, a lot of great information. Um, and I talk some about uh, the importance of saving as much as you can, for example, and uh, cutting back on um, the, the big things. I talk about going for big wins, cutting back on housing, cutting back on transportation, uh, increasing your income. These are, these are the things that you can do that will have the biggest impact on your budget. And uh, so this is this guide to being being the CFO of your own life is going to be part of a course that we're putting together called Get Rich Slowly. And uh, the course will have uh, it's got 18 interviews with people like Mr. Money Mustache and uh, Liz Weston and uh, Ramit Sethi and Gene Chatsky and just a lot of other people in the personal finance world. And uh, there will also be a weekly email with uh, specific things people can do to improve their lives. And a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'm really excited about it. And it comes out April 22nd. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I, I usually always end uh, each interview with, um, you know, just if you had one piece of advice for someone who's hoping to achieve early financial independence, uh, what do you think that would be? I don't know. I go back to the two things I mentioned earlier. The, uh, to achieve uh, early financial independence, you've got to save as much as possible. And that means cutting your expenses and boosting your income, doing both of those things so you get, achieve the maximum savings rate. Or as I call it in the uh, guide to being the CFO of your own life, you want to be as profitable as possible. You want as much profit as possible. And uh, so that, that's the mechanical thing, the, the habit that you've got to develop. But you've also got to develop the emotional, the mental side of that. And that is taking responsibility for this and uh, not caring what other people think because this is an unconventional choice and people can be very judgmental about it. They can tell you it's not possible or they can tell you why it's not a smart move. Uh, but believe me, all the people that I've talked to that have achieved financial independence early, they love it. They love the freedom that it gives them to do what they want, when they want. And they're doing amazing things and good things for the world. So develop the habit of saving as much as possible and also bolster that mentally by uh, realizing that what other people do doesn't matter. It's it Follow your own goals and your own plan. Perfect, JD. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. It's, it's been a huge pleasure, and I really appreciate it. So, Yeah, thanks, Brandon. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with JD as much as I did. Uh, it was really cool to be able to talk to the guy that created the first blog I ever read, uh, especially now that I'm a, a blogger myself, which is something I never really expected. So, yeah, it was just great to tap into some of the knowledge that he's accumulated over the last 10 years of writing about personal finance. Um, He was actually kind enough to send me an advanced copy of the Be Your Own CFO Guide, and I have to say it was excellent. Um, I I read through the entire thing, all 120 pages, even though I was meant to be (laughs) finishing up my thesis. um, I just couldn't stop reading it. It was uh, it's just such a really it's such a great way to look at personal finance, and uh, if more people treated their lives like a business and took on that role of chief financial officer, I think. Many more people would be, you know, achieving their financial goals much sooner in life. Um, and the the guide itself was packed full of excellent financial advice, which I expected because I've, like I said, I've been a long time reader of JD's work, so I knew that all of the advice was going to be great. But 
to have it packaged in such a unique and exciting way was uh, was really good. So I, I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, and JD was actually kind enough to give me my own link so that if you buy the guide through my link, I'll get a few bucks, which doesn't really seem fair because I didn't really do anything to help him out with the guide, but um, it's much appreciated anyway. So, uh, so yeah, if you're interested, head over to madfiantist.com slash GRS. Uh, and GRS stands for Get Rich Slowly. Um, so Get Rich Slowly is actually the name of the entire course, and the Be Your Own CFO's guide is uh, part of that course. So um, the rest of the course contains... Uh, there's some audio interviews with uh, some past Mad Scientist podcast guests, actually. Uh, Mr. Money Mustache and Paula Pant from AffordAnything.com. Um, and also some names from you know mainstream media like uh, Gene Chatsky from The Today Show. Uh, so that is also included in some of the packages. And uh, also in addition to the guide, uh, the Get Rich Slowly course actually comes with 52 uh, weekly emails uh, that get sent out, I think, on Mondays uh, that help keep you on track and, you know, help you take these bite-sized chunks of uh, the content that's in the guide and actually take action on it, which I think is an excellent idea. Um, a lot of times you read things and it has lots of really uh, good advice in it, but you don't act on the advice because life gets in the way. So the idea of getting 52 reminders and prompts uh, – is definitely a good thing if you're wanting to actually make, you know, meaningful change in your financial life. So, so yeah, if you uh, if you're interested in a new outlook on how to manage your finances, or if you know somebody that's maybe just getting started that just has no clue what to do, uh, then uh, I definitely recommend it. Uh, and head on over to madfiantist.com/grs, and uh, you can read all about the different packages that are available there. So yeah, I really appreciate JD taking the time. It was uh, it was an honor being able to speak with him, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. All right, see you next time. Thanks. Finance.